I'm so thrilled to have the opportunity to talk some about my new book, A Most Tolerant Little Town. Um, I have to show it off because the designers did such a beautiful job with the cover. You got to brag on that, right? So this is what it looks like. Um, and it is available for sale in your local bookstores. Um, but this project was a long time in the making for me. I actually started it way back in 2005. I was doing it originally as a work assignment after I had finished my MA before I went on to finish graduate school. I'd gotten hired to go into all of these different little Southern cities and do oral histories. One day my boss came in and he said, I have a new town that you need to go to. It's called Clinton, Tennessee. In 1956, they became the first school to successfully desegregate under Brown versus Board of Education. I would eventually realize successful was a very low bar. What that meant was that the school did not close and it did not resegregate, but they didn't have massive violence at the time. So by the end of the first week of school, the um, town had actually thousands of people rioting in the downtown square. All sorts of different white supremacist groups had come in or homegrown groups had also sprung up and taken over downtown. Eventually the governor of Tennessee sent in the National Guard, but he sent in the National Guard to enforce the court order instead of to prevent it like Orville Faubus would in Arkansas a year later. After actually a couple years of school had gone on, another group would come in and they actually bombed the school. They destroyed it and it was rebuilt by an international fundraising campaign headed up by Billy Graham. Now, if you're thinking, how did all of this happen and I never heard about it? Well, if you'd been alive in 1956, you would have heard about it. It was a huge story at the time. Everybody from the New York Times to the BBC to all of the three major television networks had journalists stationed in town. Life magazine had at one point five different photojournalists in town documenting the events. But after the story was over, everybody moved on and Clinton was forgotten. And so that is what I decided to write about. Like Julie Andrews advised, I'm going to begin at the beginning. It is a good place to start. The battle over the story of Clinton's desegregation is part of an ongoing national struggle over the politics of memory. History, like all things involving power in America today, is seen as a zero sum game. But our memories are not time machines. They reveal something much deeper and truer and more personal than a simple timeline of events. We choose what we want to remember. And we also choose what we will forget. I was able to reconstruct these previously unknown stories because the people of Clinton were generous with their memories. My narrators taught me to think of memory as being like music. The basic building blocks are the solos, one voice telling its story. As soon as more voices join in, the music of the past becomes more complex. Some people have held on to perspectives that harmonize, differing only by gradations of nuance. But more often, the various voices are in discord and disagreement. This is the most troubling part of memory, but it is also the most revealing. There is power in the complexity of a community story when it clashes like Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. If you stand next to only one voice, the rest of the orchestra seems to be in chaos. But if you can step back and listen to the whole of the group, the differing narratives become the melodies, harmonies, and descants of the piece. The process of forgetting an event as important as the desegregation of Clinton High School sounds passive, but it requires an active correction of the record. When I started my work in Clinton in 2005, my first oral history interview was with Margaret Anderson, a white woman who had been the high school's business and typing teacher. She had served as the unofficial guidance counselor for the 12 black students. Though she had not believed in desegregation when the 1956 school year began, she did obey, believe in obeying the law. 
The black student's struggle to remain in Clinton High changed her into a true integrationist. She wrote about desegregation in a series of articles for the New York Times, which she later expanded into a memoir, The Children of the South. In her narrative, she centered the black students and castigated many white leaders. Maybe that was why when I was introduced to her by a local white official, just old enough to have seen the events for himself, he admonished her. Now remember, Miss Anderson, you lied in your book, he said. You tell Rachel what we agreed had occurred. After he left, Margaret made me a mug of instant coffee and we sat down in her parlor to chat. She was nervous. But I don't want you to record it. Could I raise my hand or something, give you a signal, she asked me. That way I feel free. You know what I mean? I didn't realize it that morning in Margaret Anderson's kitchen, but I would spend the next 18 years of my life immersed in the stories the people of Clinton had to share, whether their neighbors wanted them to or not. As each person I spoke with would show me, William Faulkner was right. History wasn't dead, it was barely the past. And I don't just mean that stories told by grandparents and great-grandparents lived on in their descendants' minds. This history was so recent that many of the participants themselves were still alive. When locals looked at the pictures of white rioters around the school, they knew the faces captured on film. These were the people they shopped with at the local food city or worshiped with at First Baptist Church or traded presents with every Christmas. The people in the pictures had birth and raised them. The best way to settle the conflict over desegregation was to let it lie, many white folks said. Or, as one founder of the Tennessee White Youth told me when I asked him for an interview, honey, there was a lot of ugliness down at that school that year. Best we just move on and forget it. But though the rest of the world did forget about Clinton High School, the students, and teachers and parents and townspeople affected by the story could not. Their experiences had changed them, scarred them, broken them. Some of them were able to rebuild their lives, but others were not. Two of the people I'd come to admire, complicated individuals with the hamartias necessary for classical heroes, never recovered. Both would die by suicide. The first lesson of this book is this. History is a story of human beings, individuals responding to events already in motion and seldom under their control. Along the way, many of them end up doing things they never expected. Sometimes they act bravely, changing their world for good. At other times, they do injury to people they would have called friends. Very few of us are simply heroes or villains. None of us deserves to be remembered for only the very best or the very worst things we have done. And yet we must be accountable for our damage. And a lot of damage was caused in those years. One thing that happens when you work on a book for 18 years, is that some things that you overlook or you miss in the beginning of the process, things that might not stand out to you as being quite so important as you live with the material and also, to be honest, I'm a lot older than I used to be, as you grow up, <laughs> different things begin to stand out to you. And one thing that began to really jump out at me, especially towards the end of writing this book, was just how young the protagonists of this story are. The people who are leading this charge are 13, 14, 15, 16 year old children. They, their radical act is that they wake up every single morning and they go to school. And I think when I began this book, when I first started all of this research, when I was much closer to that age, I had seen it as being something that, oh yes, young people changed the world. Um, and now 
as I am getting older and starting to reflect on just how much we demand of our youth and our young people as the, as the adults in the room who have failed them, who have failed to solve the problems presented to them. Um, it, it really became something that I couldn't shake. And it meant that I wanted to keep particularly the students' voices at the center of this story as much as I possibly could. One thing I realized as I read other civil rights narratives is how often the kids are the ones actually fighting a lot of these battles, but they are the ones who are seen as, I guess maybe the infantry and other people are making decisions. And I wanted to highlight the fact that these students are the ones who have to survive this. They are the ones who decide to go to school. They are the ones who keep up with their studies despite violence, despite isolation, despite all of the thousands of rioters in the city square. Uh, just the bravery and the determination that was demanded of them at that young age. But the other thing that started, I started to realize is that looking at this story from today, it's very easy to say, well, of course there were rioters in the city square. Of course there was violence. Of course there was bombings. We know that that is how this sort of story is supposed to play out. But on August 27th, 1956, these kids had no idea. Nobody had done this before. And they walked into this hoping that just maybe, just maybe, this was going to be a battle that they could win easily. So this is the story of the first day of school. In the packed schoolyard, the teenagers had divided into their usual clusters and cliques. The layout of Clinton High's social strata mapped so clearly that even the freshmen bust in from the county's rural K-8 schools had already found their people. Wannabe rebels with duck ass haircuts and cuffed fraying jeans lurked on the fringes or stood on the stacked stone wall edging the campus. A few sported the black ja leather jackets that were the uniform of the local gang, creatively named the Black Jackets. Along the sidewalk, a cluster of clear faced girls with curled ponytails and circle skirts bounced nervously in their bobby socks. Elsewhere, the nerds and the Aggies and the cheerleaders had each carved out their respective places. Jocks in black letterman jackets with fuzzy orange C's prowled throughout the crowd, establishing their right to police the school. Those who had been part of the Bob Nalen Conference Championship teams had tan footballs stitched onto their coats right back. Yes. On the morning of Monday, August 27, 1956, everything on the lawn looked as it ought to on the first day of school, and yet nothing was right. Where was the din, the babble, the bustle? How could it be that no one, not a single one of the gathered gaggle was saying a word? Joanne Allen found the silence creepy. She prepared carefully for this, her first day in her new school. She'd sorted through the five skirt and shirt combinations her grandmother Minnie had sewn for her over the summer, finally settling on her favorite, a prim blouse with cap sleeves that she tucked into a dark full skirt and cinched to her slender frame with a snug black belt. She curled her bangs and twisted her ponytail into a ballet bun. Then she tucked some small white flowers into her updo. Maybe, just maybe, the white girls along the sidewalk would see her and recognize a kindred spirit, another good girl looking for friends. As ready as she could be, Joanne had picked up her lunch bag and her notebooks and headed over to Green McAdoo Grammar to meet the nine other black students from the hill who would be walking to school with her. The 12 teens who'd be desegregating Clinton High that morning were divided equally between girls and boys. But two of the girls, Joanne's best friend, friend Gail Ann Epps and Anna Teresa Caswell, did not live on the hill and would meet them at the school. Up on the hill, 
The 10 students held hands and looked toward downtown while Bobby Kane, one of two seniors, prayed for their safety. His prayer echoed the words that the Reverend O.W. Willis, pastor over at Mount Sinai Baptist Church, had murmured over them the night before. Help us to love our enemies, he had said, and send our children down the hill with peace in their hearts. After the service, had the adults whispered about what the coming day would bring? Yes, the courts were on their side, but what would that mean? Could the Supreme Court's ruling be enforced? Could equality really be won with pretty words on a page? Maybe all would be well, the black students thought. After all, in May 1954, a mere week after the Supreme Court announced its first decision overturning segregation in education, administrators in Fayetteville, Arkansas had announced they'd be desegregating their high school. By the next fall, they'd done so. Now, yes, white public outcry had stopped Sheridan, Arkansas from following suit, but both Hoxie and Charleston, Arkansas had voluntarily and quietly abolished their segregated schools in the autumn of 55. The trick seemed to be for towns to do it quickly and without public stink. Sure, a couple hundred segregationists had shown up in Hoxie a month and a half after the black teens had started classes, having been tipped off by Life magazine. But when Governor Orville Faubus refused to intervene, the local courts issued a temporary restraining order ending the protests, and that was that. So maybe, the black students thought, they'd face a few protesters suffer a couple nasty glances and it would be over. Just maybe. The students must have worried though, that their reception would be worse. They weren't continuing what the kids in Arkansas had already accomplished. This was the first time desegregation would be forced on a town and by the feds no less. If the courts got their way at Clinton High, no segregated school in America would be safe. They'd all heard the rumors, the ones that said some white folks in Anderson County were organizing, that they'd filled up reams of paper with petitions protesting the black students' entry. They'd heard about the bill filed in Chancery Court just last Wednesday, the one that would st strip Clinton High of state funds if they were allowed to start classes. And they'd seen the advertisement taken out in the Clinton Courier News by the Tennessee Federation for Constitutional Government asking people to join the organization and help prevent mixed schools. But maybe the white folks would stick to petitions and lawsuits and ads. It was time to test the segregationists' resolve. Wouldn't do for the black students to be tardy on the first day of school. As the teens gathered their school supplies and began down the hill, any family members who could come assembled to see them off. There, spread against Green McAdoo's playground and steps, were Joanne Allen's little sister and Bobby Kane's younger siblings, and some of the Hayden kids, and countless cousins. After all, wasn't everybody on the hill somehow related to these groundbreaking souls? Few of the older folks were around to witness their trek, however. Most of their parents had already left for work, some in Oak Ridge, others in shops and homes around Clinton. Across the county, the adults must have glanced up at the nearest clock and whispered a plea. Perhaps William Turner, janitor at Green McAdoo, stepped out to the school's arched brick entryway to watch his daughter Regina stride forward, notebook and pen in hand ready for her junior year. Though the picketers had been shouting and booing throughout the morning, they stilled when the 10 black students appeared. The phalanx of black teens also stopped talking as they continued along the concrete sidewalk toward Clinton High. Kind of eerie, Joanne thought, this unnatural silence on the first day of school when everyone who'd been away at camp or on vacation met up with those who'd stayed behind, helping out around the house or watching younger siblings or holding down summer jobs. Now the black students had reached the corner of the school's property. Clinton High had been built into the bottom edges of the hill 
and the sidewalk continued on down the embankment for a while before a set of stone steps on the left took visitors up to the building's front doors. At the upper corner of the grounds, the 10 black students were eye level with their new classmates, but every step inched them further down the hill until their heads were below the white team's feet. Had they ever noticed this before? How vulnerable the sidewalk made pedestrians on this stretch of road? Then the 10 teams turned left and climbed the stone steps up to the schoolyard toward the building. They walked through the assembled white high schoolers. Alfred Williams recognized many of his new classmates. Some were nodding acquaintances, a few were fishing buddies. And there were the white boys he'd played football with over the summer, meeting up in the fields and glades around town where segregation wasn't as tight, at least not for kids. The games weren't official, of course, just ad hoc matches put together when teens found themselves with little to do. Now he looked the other boys over. How large some of them were, about like grown people. As they trudged along the path, Joanne saw some of the white kids sneaking looks at her, studying her from behind new notebooks. Others took quick, shy glances, making eye contact, smiling slightly, then turning back to their friends. One group of white boys gathered by the front door, jeans freshly pressed and short sleeved shirts tucked in, sneered at the black students as they climbed the final five steps into the building. A young woman in a black sailor dress, a size too large, stood on the first step, nostrils flaring as though she smelled something unpleasant. But the black students, Joanne Allen, Bobby Kane, Anna Teresa Caswell, Minnie Ann Dickey, Gail Ann Epps, Ronald Hayden, William Latham, Alva J. McSwain, Regina Turner, Maurice Souls, Robert Thacker, and Alfred Williams had breached the double glass doors of the school without incident. Surely that alone counted as success. As I mentioned very quickly, things began to change, but it didn't happen immediately. At first, it seemed like the students were right to be so hopeful. By the end of the first period, Joanne Allen had been elected to be the vice president of her homeroom. No, she doesn't know exactly what that meant either, but it was unanimous. And the other candidate for the position was a starter on the football team. So her unanimous selection was a pretty big deal. By the end of the day, several of the black girls came out, they were smiling, they were happy, they were excited. A couple of the black boys told a local reporter that they thought things were going so well that they'd even be allowed to try out for the basketball team that, spring, uh, that coming spring. Unfortunately, by the time the afternoon had ended, a group of white teens had attacked a black woman as she was walking through town, pushed her down and broke her glasses. They threw a bottle at another woman. And by that night, several hundred people had gathered in Clinton Square for the first of what would become a series of nightly white segregationist rallies. These rallies were what began to really drive momentum of the protest movement and, and built a lot of the violence that would begin to happen in the mornings. By the second morning of school, the number of protesters around the school had doubled. Now, how many people were out there? It kind of depends on where you were standing at the time. That means it was somewhere between 50 and 100 folks. But by Wednesday, there were somewhere around 200 folks. More people came. Um, by Wednesday at lunch, there were several hundred people outside the school. And a group of the white rioters chased a couple of the black boys after lunch and began beating up Bobby Kane, one of the seniors. By Thursday, Friday, most of the white children were no longer showing up for school. Some of them had joined the rioters. Others were staying home because it didn't seem safe. The black students, however, continued to come. So did their teachers. As I said, by the end of that first week, the governor had sent in the National Guard. And for many of the white people in town, 
especially the folks who fell on the law and order side of things, that kind of made it feel like the battle was over. Like they'd, well, they wouldn't have said they won. They didn't agree with, with desegregation, but they did agree with obeying the law of the land. And they would have said, look at this. We have obeyed the law. The school is desegregated. It's all good now. The black students and their families could have told them differently, however. Um, the black students were continuing to face increasing amounts of violence within the school itself. And their parents were aware of just how many white strangers were coming through the black neighborhood called the Hill. To protect the students, the black men up on the Hill set up what was basically a volunteer military unit. They got weapons from across the region from family and friends in Knoxville and Oak Ridge and elsewhere. Many of them were World War II and Korean War veterans, so they understood how to set up patrols and how to keep their families safe. And off and on for years to come, they would station themselves at night around all of the roads leading into and out of their neighborhood, trying to keep an eye on what was happening. One of those men was Herbert Allen, Joanne's dad. And I was thrilled when I found an interview somebody had done with Herbert Allen. He died long before I was able to speak with him. And um, I had picked up on the fact that he had, he had a very special relationship with Joanne. There was a lot of affection, a lot of respect, a, just, just a close relationship. And I loved being able to learn more, both about how he viewed her in the midst of all of this, but also about how he viewed America and how he viewed his family's role in what was becoming the civil rights movement that we know of today. And one of the most amazing things that that interview gave me was an analogy for racism. Might strike some of you as odd, but as a writer, I love my, I love a good analogy, right? And we have different ways that we try to talk about this. Some people talk about racism as being like alcoholism or an addiction that white people have. It, it works, but it doesn't work for me. For me, it's not, that's not quite a good summary of what's happened. Um, Herbert Allen had another recommendation, and that's going to be part of this next section that I read. On Wednesday, September 12, 1956, Herbert Allen watched as his daughter Joanne headed off to school. He was astounded by the confident, poised young woman she was becoming. No wonder all those out-of-town journalists had wanted to interview her. For Herbert, the conflict of the past couple weeks boiled down to one simple question. Either Black Americans were citizens of the United States or they were not. He'd spent his whole life hearing he was, but he'd never been treated that way. He'd thought it was about time to settle the issue once and for all. And that was why he kept sending Joanne back down Freedman's Hill to Clinton High. The way Herbert saw it. White people's courage behavior toward him, toward his daughter, toward the 11 other students, toward the residents of the Hill. Well, all that ugly hatefulness wasn't really about the black people at all. It was an infection. No, it was an infestation in the white people's souls. An invasive weed planted inside them when they were infants. As he thought about this, was he perhaps looking at a kudzu patch? The vine the Civilian Conservation Corps had said would protect the Southeast from erosion? Racism was supposed to remind white folks of who they were and who they belonged with. But the vine and the malignity both grew and spread, one across the landscape and the other across souls, choking out all life wherever they took root. Sometimes he'd seen white folks who tried to prune their noxious, hateful weeds, a painful process that was only a temporary fix. Prejudice spawned a thousand feeder roots that popped back to life. 
what would it take to exhume all the tap roots and runners and tubers and seed pods keeping hate alive in white people's hearts? Was anyone brave enough to dig down to where their bones and their ghosts lay? And who would do that over and over again for the rest of their lives? So maybe Herbert understood why they hesitated to undertake that process. But until they did, his Joanne would never be safe. Herbert figured the white law and order crowd had stopped whatever little pruning they were doing when they heard John Casper was touring racist organizations connected to Asa Carter down in Alabama. Reports of his violent words filtered back to Clinton through the newspapers and through phone calls from white Alabamans looking for information, every bit as skeptical of the Yankee as the people of Clinton were. But the white townspeople had moved on to other better news, acting like this crisis was over. They'd been real proud when Sheriff Glad Woodward had captured his first still and arrested his first moonshiner. He'd posed for the Clinton Courier News next to a 50 gallon copper tank, hands tucked in his belt loops and his chest thrust forward. But still Herbert fretted. How long would peace last without the garden town? He wasn't concerned for his own life so much, but what of his wife and children? What would he do if Josephine was bushwhacked by a citizens council member some night? Or what if one of those black jackets attacked Joanne while she was in class? That was why he had joined the committee of men patrolling the hill. That's why he was still keeping watch. Sometimes though, he thought maybe he and Josephine had made the right choice sending Joanne to Clinton High. Like when Joanne and Carol Peters the girl who'd nominated Joanne as homeroom vice president were invited to Washington, D.C. by the creator and moderator of the college press conference, part of ABC's Sunday afternoon news lineup. She'd arranged the two girls to interview United States Attorney General Herbert Brownell. Appearing alongside the high schoolers would be Allard K. Lowenstein, a Jewish graduate student at the University of North Carolina who was already a political activist and who would become a U.S. congressman and representative to the U.N. Human Rights Commission. Both Carol and Joanne proposed questions for the attorney general to answer, but all of Joanne's questions, one she'd pieced together through long conversations with her family, were veto. She suspected they were too pointed. So she asked him easier questions, like whether the president would make a speech about civil rights while on the campaign trail that fall, even on that one, the attorney general fudged. I don't know, he replied. The girls seemed to have so much in common, Joanne thought. Even though Carol and her mom went to a white hotel while Joanne was whisked away to the black YWCA where she stayed on her own, almost like a real grown-up, instead of a girl newly turned 15. Maybe her friendship with Carol meant her time at Clinton High was about to turn around. Maybe she would get to have the high school experience she dreamed of. Maybe her goodness and her abilities would show the white citizens council members and all the other white people they needed to give in and accept the inevitable. The black students were in Clinton High to stay. Other black students were also having some wins at the high school, even if those successes didn't lead to a national television appearance. One Thursday in September, first year history teacher Sue Byerly called Bobby Kane to the front of the classroom. She asked him to recite the Declaration of Independence from memory. He stood straight and proud. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, he said to his white classmates, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. He made it to the end of the document without a stutter or a stammer or a misplaced word. This, his public reclamation of the American dream was his first real academic achievement at Clinton High School. And it was when all the students' parents could feel real swelled up over. But talking to Bobby's parents, Herbert knew the strain of the preceding weeks had already changed their son. 
He reminded me of the men I had interviewed when I served as a Marine combat correspondent in World War II, reporter George McMillan noted after he spoke with the boy that same week. As we talked, drops of sweat gathered on his forehead and began to run down his cheek, and he pressed his palms together nervously. George thought Bobby had blocked some of his memories because when he tried to answer questions, his words would trail away and he would seem to get lost in his thoughts. It's impossible for men who have really had it to talk about their experience until their memories have had an interval in which to reject the intolerable, George explained to his readers. He suggested that the violence of the past few weeks had given the team combat fatigue or what we today term post-traumatic stress disorder. Bobby had always been patient and kind with his siblings, but lately he'd been snapping at them, sometimes without provocation. His mother thought about lecturing him, but how could she add any more stress to his days? Surely it was enough that he awoke, dressed, and walked down the hill to school. I'm gonna stop my reading right there, at least for the moment. I love to have a conversation about this book. I have many thoughts after 18 years of working on it. So if y'all have questions, I would love to hear them. Thank you so much, Rachel, for those readings and for giving us a little uh, background um, on the book and how it came to be. Um, how so how many people at this time lived in this town uh altogether roughly the town itself had a couple thousand people in it um and it was one of those places where the black population compared to the white population was remarkably small so when it came time to desegregate, there were only about 30 black students of high school age. About half of them didn't wanna do it. Many of them, because of how hard it had been to go to high school before that, they were getting shipped out of county, um, had actually just moved on with their lives. They had jobs, they had spouses, they joined the military, um, they, were, they were gone. And so, yeah, that's how, that's how the number ended up so very tiny. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was not a big place. So, so that, Brings to mind you you were talking about what these what these children were doing. Um, you just referred to the fact that they essentially had PTSD from going to school every day, right? Um, and you know when you first started, you were talking about the fact that this is something that didn't remain part of widely known history, even though um, it. Wasn't it was a really important part of it in terms of it, you know, being the place where um, desegregation happened involuntarily, you know, for the for the first time. So, can you talk a little bit about the difference between the names that we are told in history books, like you know, the fact that Billy Graham was part of it, for instance, the difference between those names and what they actually mean, and all of the all of those other people in this very tiny town who impacted history and what it, what we end up knowing about those people. Um, and it seemed, because it seems like how important, you know, those contributions are, uh, are mismatched <laughs> with, um, you know, what we know uh, about those people and who we know and who's actually making history, um, you know, on the ground. Yeah, I think a lot of times when it when when it comes time for us to talk about the past, especially when we are trying to find good heroes and villains, which we love to do in our narrative, right? It's it's such an easy way of understanding the world, also of making ourselves a little. We'll get to that, but also of giving ourselves a little more room to not be part of the big story. Um, we look, we look for a few giant names. So we look for people like Billy Graham, or, you know, if we're talking about the civil rights movement, we talk about Martin Luther King Jr. Or if we're talking about, um, you know, 
a war, we look for the generals. Those are the sorts of folks that we gravitate toward. And I think that there is a real role for that. I think we do need people in all of these different moments who are casting a broad national vision for who we are going to become. I think we need the people who are the great orators, who are the dreamers, who can give us that sort of rhetoric to help us make sense of what's happening. But when it comes time to actually make change in our nation, it's not done on a national level. It's not done on a state level. It is about ordinary everyday people in tiny little places showing up and saying, my world is gonna be different today. And it's about, you know, for these kids, their radical act is that they went to school. Now, in the face of that sort of violence, it was an incredibly radical and brave act. I'm not mm -hmm. taking that away from them at all, but they're not, they're not marching on the White House. They are going to school. And that is where actual, actual change can occur. Do protests matter? Yes, because they help us find each other. They don't affect actual change. Um, and on the other side of the mountains here in Tennessee, especially after our school shooting here in Nashville last May, we've had a number of protests at our state house. Our lawmakers know that they can just wait until we go home and then they can continue to, I, I won't even say they do nothing. They can, do, can, they can continue to do worse than nothing. They can continue to put new roadblocks up. Um, that, is, that is what it looks like when we are working, this is falling apart, but let me back up. What actually matters is what we are able to do in our own neighborhoods, in our own schools, in our own communities. And if we're all out doing that, we can begin to affect actual national level change in a way that we really have not been able to do so heretofore. Mm. Yeah. And I think um, the the a, a, another value of protest, like you say, is the protest itself isn't going to make the change happen. They can inspire people to do those small changes, Absolutely. You know, which oh. is helpful. Being out, you know, that's but but you're right. Every, it's without, every time. I, oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say, but you're right that that without like regular folk you know, make, you know, making small moves in the right direction or big moves in the right direction towards, you know, uh, towards I'm, I am, um, leaning into my choice of the word right direction being the direction towards justice and a lack of racism. <laughs> I'm not gonna, not gonna, <laughs> not mince any words about that y'all just, just so you know, um, yes. you might think another direction is right and that's okay but uh, just owning my own personal opinion. <laughs> um, yeah. But in this case, so, um, you know, but that, so, so there, are, so there are those, there's that activity, right. Um, sort of writ large. Um, but what, what really makes the changes are, like you say, on the local level, local, local elections, for instance, are just hugely important in terms of like what actually happens in people's lives. And then what, you know, ends up sort of upstream in terms of who's representing you and, you know, and, and, and what happens, that sort of thing. So, yeah, I think that's a really, um, that's a really valuable point. It takes all of it at the end, right? Oh, yeah. And, and there is a good, I mean, like I show up in March all the time. Yeah. <laughs> He's saying, stay home, like, no, March. Yeah. In the streets. But in terms of actually making substantive change, our politicians need to worry about us more at the election. Yeah, they need to know whether or not they we will let them keep their job if they don't act I mean, right. If you look at the polls, America has a new silent majority. The politicians who are currently representing many of us do not represent what we claim to believe. Yeah. The reality is they have no reason to. Right, right. They, they need to be scared of how we're going to vote next time. Yeah. Um, or have the, or have our districts changed? So they're not so gerrymandered to the point that, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, Nashville. But that's a whole other thing. Anyway, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> that's a whole other conversation. We could compare notes in, you know, North Carolina, Tennessee. Like, yeah. there's lots of places, but that's a whole other thing. I'm afraid but, there's a new playbook in town. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, and not new necessarily, but boy, has it been honed and refined. Gosh, they're using of, it right now. Yeah, yeah in of late. Um, but we're gonna get back on track um, <laughs> uh, with this. Um, so, um. You have been talking about desegregation and using the term desegregation. And for anyone who might be, you know, watching this, who perhaps has been thinking in terms of school integration, like, wasn't it great that after, you know, Brown versus the Board of, of Education, schools were integrated? Um, if you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about the difference between those two terms, what they actually mean and, and you know, what they meant in Clinton, right, at the time, but, you know, a little bit maybe about what they mean now as well. Yeah, so I I very purposefully do not use the word integration to talk about this. Integration is the full elimination of prejudice and the, the restitution of full opportunity to all children, regardless of their race, their gender, their creed, their class, anything else that they are walking into a school building with. Um, we've never, ever done that. Uh, most of what we have done at its very best has looked like what happened at Clinton, um, where there were 12 black teenagers who were ooh, barely permitted to join 800 some odd white teenagers in a school setting where they were not welcome, where they were not allowed to study their, their literature, where they were not taught about black artists or black history or black culture or any of those other aspects of what blackness in America has meant heretofore. Um, and far too often that is exactly how we have handled any attempt to create racial openings within our within our schools. Very often this has actually meant the elimination of black educational institutions. And a lot of these spaces were um, very important communal spaces for black neighborhoods. You know, Green McAdoo, the elementary school, the black elementary school in Clinton, that had been where generations of kids had been educated and it was underfunded. At some points, the teachers were handling classrooms of 90 students at a time. Mm. I mean, the numbers were appalling. Mm. Nevertheless, when those 12 black students go to take their matriculation tests to join classes at Clinton High School, multiple ones of them tested into the college track at the school. So underfunded, under-resourced did not mean a substandard education. Black teachers were heroes in their communities. And very often it was the only opportunity for Black women to move into anything like the middle class. Um, I don't have the exact statistic before me, but when desegregation began, something like three quarters of them ended up being demoted or fired as a part of this, while white teachers kept their jobs. And so the way that we handled desegregation decimated Black education and the Black educated leadership in many of those communities. Moving forward, we have to do better. Moving forward, it cannot be that other people are allowed to join what it looks like to be middle class and white. We have to start asking, what is it going to look like to live in a world in which all children have an opportunity to grow and to thrive where all children see themselves growing and thriving, where they have role models and examples ahead of them. Um, and what does it look like where all children are also seeing other people who don't look like them, providing leadership and being role models? Um, right. That because be that's that's the other that's the other side of it, isn't it, in terms of what actual integration would look like. It's a big part of it is um, 
black kids um, in this case specifically, but all sorts of kids who may yes. be in the in in a in a population in their town that that is either numerically in the minority or in terms of power in the minority, because a lot of times black you know, in many Southern towns, we know black folks can outnumber white folks, but the resources allotted to them uh, is not commensurate, right? Um, so, but then the other side of that is, what about the white kids who never see a black teacher? Yeah. Right, who, who are never taught about anything outside of, uh, you know, the history and literature and culture of whiteness in the global North, uh, and who then, of course, grow up, you know, maintaining, um, even while at, in this day and age, most people will not look at themselves and, and say that they had any sort of racist upbringing, but there's, you know, there's this white supremacy that's baked in when integration doesn't actually happen. Um, and when all of the messages that are coming at you are, uh, still, you know, very narrow interpretations of, of, what it is to be anything other than white. Um, uh, yeah, so um, so it's 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 not just better for the kids who are underserved. It's you know, it's better for everybody and for the entire, you know, our entire <laughs> nation culture being, right? when we can all see all of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the uncomfortable but realistic parts, of reading about any sort of success in furthering equality in education is realizing that that tends to happen when you study white kids and when they do better. Um, but that is what all of the statistics show. Yeah. Everyone thrives when everybody thrives. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I liked the I liked it when you as part of your reading you talked about you know the zero sum sense we have yes. uh, about things and how that's just uh, and we we apply it to so much yes. uh, and and it's so destructive uh, you know this idea that, well well if I get something then that means something has been taken away from you and we can't have that right as opposed to hey why don't we all lift each other up and then we can all be up together <laughs> yeah. Yes. And the reality is that creating true opportunity in America is going to mean that we will have some people who do not have as much power or as much wealth as they currently do. Right. As much as they're used to. Right. Yes. Yeah. As much as they as much as been has as has been taken for granted uh, until now. Um, yeah. And you're absolutely right. And that that is an, and it's that's really uncomfortable for a lot of people. I think yes. the the thing to think about though is like what has that where where has that power really gotten us and even gotten those people you and know what is going to be good for the body politic moving forward yeah it, yeah. it cannot always just be about the individual right right eventually we have to care about our neighbors yeah and what is it you're actually losing you know yes. in terms of like you know i mean if if you have a hundred times more than I do and you lose 10%, you still have a way like a lot more than I do, <laughs> right? <laughs> You're still doing just fine. <laughs> not, not worried about it. Yeah. <laughs> but we don't, you know, we don't think about that. You know, we just, we're just like, yeah, it's just, you know, we have, we, we, we do have that. Um, and I can't speak for everyone, but, you know, I think, I think it is, it, it's fairly common, you know, uh, for us, uh, you know, in the United States to have, have that, have that sort of built in sense of scarcity and, you know, um, and that idea that, that, uh, um, yeah, that you have to hold on to everything and that if, you know, some, someone else gets something that it's somehow taking something away from you. Yeah. That there's not actually going to be enough to go around. Right. When, when there is, I mean, in, in real terms, there actually is plenty. Yes. Yeah. There's plenty to go around. Yeah. Um, so we're at the top of the hour and I, I am, um, I so enjoyed listening to you read and I've been talking too much just because this is, uh, uh, it's a, it's a topic, um, that I could talk about all, all night. And so I apologize to anyone who's watching, who's like, 
we came to hear the author. Why are you talking? But thank you for indulging me um, and talking with me. And before we go, um, I just wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind if there's any other books that folks who are listening, if there's any other books that you think they should read, they're either on this topic or not. Um, and, uh, and, and then I'll just invite, uh, so a book recommendation or two and your final thoughts before we say goodnight. Okay. I am currently obsessed by a new novel. It's called The Lost Journals of Sacagawea. And I, it, I mean, so she's, it's her second book. The first book is way easier. It's called Perma Red. Um, and of course, now I'm talking about it. So I've blanked on her name. I'm going to look it up real quick. Pardon my Very typing, y'all. Yeah. Please, uh, please do. Yeah. Um, but she is an indigenous author and her work is just phenomenal. Um, so I knew I loved Perma Red. And then this book came out. And I'm going to warn your readers it's a sort of book like I'm reading it without any wine in my hands. I turn off the music. I sit down and I focus because what she's doing with this story and with language and with history and the past, phenomenal. It's it's just breathtaking. So uh, is it Deborah Magpie Erling? Yes. Yeah, Deborah Magpie Erling. Yeah, so yeah. Perma Red uh, in the Lost Journals of Sacagawea. Thank you for that. I So those are on my radar now. There's... As booksellers, there are so many books in oh, so little time. So I always love a, a direct uh, <laughs> recommendation. I yeah. can't even imagine. Uh, yeah, so that that is currently what I'm reading, and I, I'm just absolutely obsessed with it. So everyone else should read it too. Excellent. Thank you. You've heard it here. Uh, so add that to your TBR pile, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Rachel. I'm going to encourage... Um, Anyone uh, who's listening right now or watching the video later to pick up a copy of, of your book, Most Tolerant Little Town, and, um, and read the story of Clinton, um, uh, which is not well known, uh, but will be better known now after you spent, was it 18 years with it? 18 years. Yeah. And I got the book written. So thank you for your have it out in the world. Yeah. Thanks for your your perseverance. Um, and then just uh, any final thoughts from you, or if you want to talk about what you uh, are working on uh, now or might be coming up next. Yeah. So I I am figuring out what is next. Um, I have a broad idea of the topic. I'm really interested by questions of white ladyhood and well-intentioned white women who end up causing more trouble than they solve. Um, I think that's an important thing for us to be addressing and exploring in the world right now. I might have some personal experience with it too. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm diving into that. Um, there is some disagreement about exactly who that is going to mean I am talking about next, but... <laughs> That is going to be what the project involves and we are figuring out exactly who it will involve. So stay tuned. Yeah, I, I will. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, hopefully we'll be able to, to see you again whenever that. Love that. I have really enjoyed this conversation. So yeah. thank you for yeah. me. Oh, our, it's been my pleasure and we're happy to have you um, at Malaprops after a fashion. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, oh. And so, um, Everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, and uh, again, we encourage you uh, to uh, pick up A Most Tolerant Little Town by Rachel Louise Martin. Um, if you have the means, purchase it from your local indie. If not, go to your library. Librarians are awesome. Uh, and they are in some crosshairs right now a lot of the times and 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 need your love. So, yeah. Um, I'm saying that uh, during Band Books Week, by the way. Um, so uh, another, another something, something else is near and dear to <laughs> the hearts of booksellers everywhere. Um, so thanks so much again, Rachel, um, and yeah, good luck with with your with your new project and everything else. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. All right, good night, everybody. Bye, Chelsea.